Our first guest, Patty Hearst, victim of the most bizarre kidnapping story in American history. Since the session is secret, no one will say what Ms. Hearst testified about. But her attorneys have said that she would voluntarily provide the details of her kidnapping, in which she claims William Harris helped tie her up while Emily Harris drove the getaway car. So long ago, and I've really put it behind me, and so it does feel like it was someone else. There's been a big kidnapping on the West Coast. The victim is Patricia Hearst, the daughter of newspaper executive Randolph Hearst and a granddaughter of the legendary William Randolph Hearst. Patricia Campbell Hearst gained notoriety in 1974 when she was kidnapped by the Symbolese Liberation Army, SLA. Her 19-month captivity took a shocking turn as she seemingly joined her captors in criminal activities, including a bank robbery. Convicted in 1976, Patty's trial revealed conflicting narratives of voluntary association and coercion. The case was marked by twists and claims of brainwashing. And no one actually knows if she actually joined voluntarily or it was the effect of her trauma. Patricia Campbell Hurst was born on the 20th of February 1954 in San Francisco, California. She's the granddaughter of American publisher William Randolph Hearst, who created the largest newspaper, magazine, and film business in the world. Her great-grandmother was philanthropist Phoebe Hearst. The family wielded immense political influence and opposed organized labor, gold mine workers' right, and communism since before World War II. Patty who preferred to be called Patricia, is the third of five daughters of Randolph Apersonhurst and Catherine Wood Campbell. She was raised primarily in Hillsboro and attended its Crystal Springs School for Girls, Sacred Heart School in Athton, and the Santa Catalina School in Monterey. She attended Menlo College in Athton, California, before transferring to the University of California, Berkeley. Patty was encouraged by her parents in athletics and displayed talents at tennis, swimming, horseback riding, and she enjoyed deep sea fishing and duck hunting with her father, who taught her how to use a rifle. Patty's father was among a number of heirs to the family fortune and did not have control of the highest interests. Her parents had not considered it necessary to take preventive measures to assure their children's personal security. At the time of her abduction, Patty was a sophomore at Berkeley studying art history. She lived with her fiancé, 26-year-old Stephen Weed, a former teacher at her Catholic high school. When Weed won a fellowship and teaching grant to the University of California at Berkeley, she followed him and enrolled there. They became engaged in December of 1973. 1972, I went to work at Crystal Springs teaching math and geometry. It was a small private girls' school. and. Uh, she came to some guitar classes I was giving. I don't think she really was interested in learning the guitar. She just wanted to hang out with one of the older teachers. It was Patty who targeted Steve for romance first, not the other way around. Patty was just 18 years old when she decided to move in with Steve Weed, and they got a nice little apartment very near the campus of Berkeley. On February 4th, 1974, 19-year-old Patty was kidnapped from her Berkeley apartment by a small urban guerrilla left-wing group called the Symbonese Liberation Army, SLA, after they burst into the apartment and beaten Stephen. Patty's captors took her to a radical safe house where they confined her in a dark closet. We just finished having dinner watching a TV show and getting ready to study. And uh, there was a knock on the door. There was a woman at the front door, having her hand in front of her face. Knock on the door, alluded to an accident. Two men pushed through the front door. Uh, they pushed me back, shouting, get your face on the floor, get your face on the floor. They started kicking me and hitting me. Kept telling me, keep your head down. They started demanding, where's the safe? Where's the money? I was trying to figure out what was happening. And the natural conclusion is that it was a robbery. He has no idea that we're kidnapping his fiance. I could hear Patty whimpering in the other room. Her hearse is tied up. So I pick her up, throw her in the trunk, and we got away. My name is William Taylor Harris. I personally took Patty Hearst out of her apartment and put her into a getaway car. You know, the reality isn't always on the surface. 
Sometimes you have to look a little bit deeper to see what's real. We kidnapped a freak. Well, I heard a scream and then I heard what were gunshots. And I looked out the window and all I saw were the, um, the sparks of the gun going off and I hit the floor. Did you hear the, the girl who was being taken out say anything? Well, I heard her pleading, please no, not me, or words to that effect. Today, police were digging bullets out of parked cars and windows and walls all up and down the street. They later found the empty getaway car. It had been stolen and abandoned. Police don't have an awful lot of leads, but they know this kidnapping was too well organized to be spur of the moment. A letter from uh, the Symbionese Liberation Army came in uh, in the morning mail, and uh, basically the communique confirms that uh, they are holding Patricia Hurst. Mom, Dad, I'm okay. Um. Patty's kidnapping was partially opportunistic as she resided near the SLA hideout. According to testimony at trial, the group's main intention was to leverage the Hearts family political influence to free SLA members Russ Little and Joe Romero, who had been arrested for the November 1973 murder of Marcus Foster, American professional basketball player and superintendent of Oakland Public Schools. We had to do it as a matter of principle. It also was a result of our general politics and who we targeted in our minds as being enemies of the people. The fact that she was a Hearst was specific. We were attacking the Hearst Corporation. We were attacking the media empire. After the state refused to free the men, the SLA demanded that Hearst's family distribute $70 worth of food to every needy Californian an operation that would cost an estimated $400 million. In response, Patty's father obtained a loan and arranged the immediate donation of $2 million worth of food to the poor of the Bay Area for one year in a project called People in Need. After the distribution descended into chaos, the SLA refused to release Patty. Before any form of negotiation for the release of the subject prisoner be initiated, that an action of good faith be shown on the part of the Hearst family. This gesture is to be in the form of food to the needy and the unemployed. In the last week, it has become obvious to the SLA and to all hungry people and to me that my father has not even attempted to show a gesture of good faith. Arrangements have been made for $2 million to be delivered to a tax-exempt charitable organization. During her capture, Patty was subjected to hours of revolutionary ideology, sleep and food deprivation, rape, and death threats, which is the main reason people suggest why she joined the SLA. There was, no hint, there was no hint of politics in her. She was a kid. She yeah. was 19 years old. And she um, was utterly unknown to the, her kidnappers, except that she was a Hearst and a student at Cal. But what they didn't know is that she was at a very restless moment in her life. She was engaged to be married with, to Stephen Weed, whom she was living with, but unhappy, starting to develop a bit of a political consciousness. And after those first few days of terror, and they were horrible days of mm -hmm. terror, she did become receptive to their appeals. In a trial afterward, Patty recalled what happened to her, testifying that she was held for weeks in a closet, blindfolded and with her hands tied. During this time, SLA founder Donald T. Fries repeatedly threatened her with death. She was allowed to leave the closet for meals, still blindfolded, and began to participate in the group's political discussion. She was given a flashlight for reading and SLA political tracks to memorize. Patty was confined in the closet for weeks. She said, DeFries told me that the War Council had decided or was thinking about killing me or me staying with them and that I better start thinking about that as a possibility. I accommodated my thoughts to go inside with theirs. In April 1974 account, Patty claimed she had been offered the choice of being released or join the SLA. When asked for her decision, Patty elected to remain and fight with the SLA. The blindfold was removed, allowing her to see her captors for the first time. After this, she was given daily lessons on her duties, especially weapon drills. Angela Atwood told Patty that the others wanted Patty to experience sexual freedom within the unit. Patty later claimed to have been raped by William Wolfe and DeFries. 
On April 3, 1974, two months after she had been abducted, Patia announced on an audio tape released to the media that she had joined the SLA and adopted the name Tanya, a tribute to Che Guevara's comrade Heidi Tamara Bunki Baider. In the tape, she said, I have been given the choice of one, being released in a safe area, or two, joining the forces of the Symbolese Liberation Army and fighting for my freedom and the freedom of all oppressed people. I have chosen to stay and fight. The tape came with a photo of Patty in revolutionary gear, holding a submachine gun against the background of the Asalized flag of a seven-headed cobra. I have chosen to stay and fight. I have been given the name Tanya. Patria Muerte, Venceremos. On April 15, 1974, Patty was recorded on a surveillance video holding an M1 carbon while robbing the Sunset District branch of the Hibernia Bank at 1415 Noriega Street in San Francisco. Patty identified under her pseudo name of Tanya. Two men entered the bank while the robbery was occurring and were shot and wounded by the SLA. According to testimony at her trial, a witness thought that Patty had been several paces behind the others when running to the getaway car. The FBI agent heading the investigation said that SLA members were photographed pointing guns at Patty during the robbery. Eyewitnesses say that as bank robberies go, this one was extremely well planned. Another one of the SLA women in her gun stood about here. Now she had a great view of all the tellers and all the other people in the bank. But there's speculation that Patty Hearst may have been forced into all this because this woman's gun was also pointed in the direction of Patty Hearst. Greetings to the people. This is Tanya. On April 15th, my comrades and I expropriated $10,660.02 from the Sunset Branch of the Hibernia Bank. Casualties could have been avoided had the persons involved cooperated with the People's Forces and kept out of the way until after our departure. I was positioned so that I could hold customers and bank personnel who were on the floor. My gun was loaded, and at no time did any of my comrades intentionally point their guns at me. Careful examination of the photographs, which were published, clearly shows this is true. Our action of April 15th forced the corporate state to help finance the revolution. My ex-fiancé, I don't care if I ever see him again. During the last few months, Stephen has shown himself to be a sexist, ageist pig. Not that this was a sudden change from the way he always was. For those people who still believe that I'm brainwashed or dead, I see no reason to further defend my position. Consciousness is terrifying to the ruling class, and they will do anything to discredit people who have realized that the only alternative to freedom is death, and that the only way we can free ourselves of this fascist dictatorship is by fighting, not with words, but with guns. I am a soldier in the people's army. Patria o muerte, venceremos. On May 16, 1974, the manager of Mills Sporting Goods in Angelwood, California, observed a minor theft by William Harris, who had been shopping with his wife Emily. While Patty waited across the road in a van, the manager and an employee followed Harris out and confronted him. There was a scuffle, and the manager restrained Harris when a pistol fell out of Harris's waistband. Patty discharged the entire magazine of an automatic carbon into the overhead storefront, causing the manager to dive behind a light post. He tried to shoot back, but Patty began aiming closer. FBI agent Charles described the incident in 1988 saying, Patty pointed an M1 carbon and fired the whole clip, and then she took another rifle and shot some more. As I recall, there's about 30 shots, and there were people walking along the sidewalk. Thank God she missed them. Patty and the Harrises made a getaway in the van, they later ditched it, but a parking ticket left behind led police to the SLA, whereabout. Patty and the Harris couple hijacked two cars and abducted the owners. One was a young man who found Patty so impressionable that he was reluctant to report the incident. He testified at the trial to her repeatedly asking if he was okay. 
police had surrounded the main base of the SLA in Los Angeles before these three returned, so they hid elsewhere. The six SLA members inside the hideout died, some in gunfight with the police, others in a resulting fire, and defreeze by suicide by gunshot. It was initially thought that Patio had also died during this confrontation. Warrants were issued for the arrest of Patty and the Harrises for several felonies, including two counts of kidnapping. In 1974, there's a big difference between the San Francisco Police Department and the Los Angeles Police Department. The LAPD is a militarized force with a new invention in police tactics called SWAT. We fired the tear gas round. That was to cause them to surrender, that the gunfire erupted. They're much better armed than we are. This shootout was incredibly dramatic on its own terms. But what made it even crazier and even more of a national obsession was that everyone the cops, the viewers, thought Patty Hearst was inside the house. This heiress is about to be murdered on live television. As two of her kidnappers get stopped by security at a sporting goods store, Hearst, left alone with car keys and an assault rifle, shot up the building to come to their aid. That was really the moment where she really established that she was really a member of the SLA and no longer a victim. The fallout was immediate. The next day, her other six captors were tracked down to a house in South Central LA and killed in a shootout with LAPD. Later, when Emily Harris went to a Berkeley rally to commemorate the death of Angela Atwood, DeFries and other founding members who had died in Los Angeles during the police siege, Harris recognized Atwood's acquaintance, Kathy Solia, among the radical whom she'd known from civil rights groups. Solia introduced the three fugitives to Jack Scott, an athletics reformer and radical, and he agreed to provide them help and money. On June 7, Patty and the Harrises and the media recorded speech for the murder of their group. Patty proclaimed her love for William Wolfe and vowed that the SLA would continue its fight and the diminished group went into hiding. Patty was also alert to have helped make improvised explosive devices which were used in two unsuccessful attempts to kill police during August 1975. On April 21, 1975, four members of the SLA had up the Crocker Bank in Carmichael, California. During the holdup, Emily Harris shot and killed a bystander, Myrna Opsal. In which a mother of four, Myrna Opsal, was killed while helping her church deposit donations. Later in September, Patty, Bill, and Emily Harris, and a new SLA member, Wendy Yushimura, were arrested in San Francisco apartment and asked for her occupation while being booked. But he told the officer, Irving Gorilla, it was the end of the SLA and its short-lived dangerous revolutionary dream. In March 1973, DeFries escaped from prison and headed to his friends in Berkeley. With the help of Little and Wolfie, he found shelter with two young white women, Nancy Ling Perry and Patricia. In the meantime, a young couple, Bill and Emily Harris, had arrived in Berkeley with their friends Gary and Angela Atwood from Bloomington, Indiana. Several of the SLA members came out of the Indiana University Theater Program, mm -hmm. and they did have a sense of guerrilla theater about them. They knew how to put on a show, and that's why they were so captivating to the nation. They had no real plan for what they were going to do more than 24 hours ahead, but during each act, they knew how to get a lot of attention. The Harrises and Angela Outwood soon joined radical groups and connected with the Fries and the others. By the end of the summer, fiercely opposed to what they viewed as an oppressive racist society, the radicals formed the Symbionese Liberation Army. Their militant, loosely Marxist properties included ending racism, monogamy, the prison system, and all other institutions that have maimed and sustained capitalism. De Vries took the name General Field Marshal Singh and became the group leader. 
Under Black Nationalist program included creating a system of homelands within the US for minority groups armed with stolen weapons and funded by robberies and the group trained in military maneuvers in the Berkeley Hills. In August the group moved to a group safe house in Concord, California. The group included Donald DeFries, Nancy Ling Perry, Patricia Sotisik, Bill Harris, Emily Harris, Angela Atwood, Russell Little, Joe Romero, William Wolfie, and Camilla Hall. The small group of mostly white, upper middle class, well educated young men and women led by an escaped black convict were determined to create a violent revolution. On November 6, the SLA group stepped into the public stage by murdering Black Oakland School Superintendent Marcus Foster. The SLA had targeted Foster because he supported identity system for students, but by the time of his murder, he had in fact withdrawn that support. The SLA members went into hiding after the Foster killing. Two months later, local police picked up Russ Little and Joe Romero on a traffic violation in a vehicle full of SLA weapons and propaganda. The two revolutionaries were taken in for questioning and arrested for the Foster murder. Later that day, just ahead of the police, Nancy Ling Perry set fire to the Concord safe house. When police arrived, they found the house scorched but not burned down, leaving a significant amount of evidence intact. After that, the kidnapping happened. Symbi Symbionese is a made-up word. Mm -hmm. They didn't liberate anything or anyone, <laughs> and they called themselves an army. Yeah. There were, at most, a dozen people involved. So it was an incredibly disorganized, dysfunctional group of people that improvised their ways along. Interestingly, most of them, or several of them, came out of the Indiana University dramatic drama program, and they, they excelled at guerrilla theater. They liked to put on shows, shows yeah. but they really had no, uh, no judgment of what to do once they had it. At the time of her arrest, Patty's weight had dropped to 87 pounds, 40 kilograms, and she was described by psychologist Margaret Singer in October 1975 as low IQ, low effect zombie. Shortly after her arrest, doctors recorded signs of trauma. Her IQ was measured as 112, whereas it had previously been 130. There were huge gaps in her memory regarding her pre-Tania life. She was smoking heavily and had nightmares. Without a mental illness or defect, a person is considered to be fully responsible for any criminal action not done under duress, which is defined as a clear and present threat of death or serious injury. Psychiatrist Lewis West, a professional at the University of California, Los Angeles, was appointed by the court in his capacity as a brainwashing expert and worked without a fee. After the trial, he wrote a newspaper article asking President Carter to release Patty from prison. The trial commenced on January 15, 1976. According to Patty's testimony, her captors had demanded she appear enthusiastic during the robbery and warned she would pay with her life for any mistakes. Her defense lawyer, Lee Bailey, provided photographs showing that SLA members, including Camilla Hall, had pointed guns at Patty during the robbery. The head of the Symbionese Liberation Army told her, we're going to rob a bank. You're going to be up front. There'll be a number of guns behind you, one false step on your part, and we'll gun you down. In reference to the shooting at Millie's sporting goods on her decision to not escape, Patty testified that she was instructed throughout her captivity on what to do in an emergency. She said one class in particular had a situation similar to the store manager's detention of the Harrises. Patty testified that when it happened I didn't even think, I just did it, and if I had not done it, and if they had been able to get away, they would have killed me. After Patty testified that Wolf had raped her, Emily Harris gave a magazine interview from jail alleging that Patty's keeping a trinket given to her by Wolfie was an indication that she had been in a romantic relationship with him. Patty said she had kept the stone carving because she thought it was a pre-Columbian artifact of archaeological significance. The prosecutor, James L. Browning Jr., used Harris's interpretation of the item. Some jurors later said they regarded the carving, which Browning waved in front of them, as powerful evidence that Patty was lying. In his closing argument, prosecutor Browning suggested that Patty had taken part in the bank robbery without coercion. 
Browning, who later became a judge, also suggested to the jury that as the female SLA members were feminists, they would not have allowed Patty to be raped. In her autobiography, Patty expressed disappointment with what, what she saw as Bailey's lack of focus in the crucial end stage of her trial. She described him as having the appearance of someone with a hangover and spilling water down the front of his pants while making a disjointed closing argument. Bailey being her defense attorney. On March 20, 1976, Patty was convicted of bank robbery and using a firearm during the commission of a felony. She was given the maximum sentence possible of 35 years imprisonment, pending a reduction at the final sentence here, which Carter declined to specify. Because Judge Carter had died, Judge William Oreck determined Patty's sentence. He gave her seven years imprisonment, commenting that rebellious young people who, for whatever reason, became revolutionaries and voluntarily commit criminal acts will be punished. In the immediate aftermath of the uh, kidnapping, this was pure terrorism and she had no part in it, she had no foreknowledge, but after a few weeks, um, there was a bond that developed between uh, Patricia and her kidnappers. And if you look at the range of her activities from her kidnapping in February of 74, the robbery of the Hibernia Bank with the very familiar uh, photographs of her with the machine gun, all the way to her arrest in September of 75, almost a year and a half later, the enormous numbers of crimes she committed three bank robberies, one in which a woman was killed, uh, shooting up a street in Los Angeles, um, bombings that she participated in in San Francisco, and the multiple, multiple opportunities she had to escape, I conclude that she did, in fact, voluntarily join the SLA. This is William and Emily Harris were convicted on a simple kidnapping charge, as opposed to the more serious kidnapping for ransom or kidnapping with bodily injury and they were released after serving a total of eight years each. After serving 22 months, President Jimmy Carter commuted Patty's federal sentence, freeing her eight months before she was eligible for her first parole hearing. Her release on February 1, 1979 was under conditions, and she remained on probation for the state sentence on the sporting goods store plea. Years later, on the 20th of January 2001, she recovered full civil rights when President Bill Clinton granted her a pardon on his last day in office. And, and after she was arrested, it made sense for her to say, the hell with all this stuff, I want to go back, be a Hearst again. That's right. She is the only person in American history to receive a commutation from one president and a pardon from another. After serving nearly two years behind bars, Patty had her sentence commuted by President Jimmy Carter. She got married and settled with her family in Connecticut and raised two daughters. Patty published the memoir Every Secret Thing, co-written with Alvin Moscow in 1981. Her accounts resulted in authorities considering bringing new charges against her. She was interviewed in 2009 on NBC and said that the prosecutor had suggested that she had been in a relationship with Wolfie. She described that as outrageous and an insult to rape victims. But he produced a special for the Travel Channel titled Secret of San Simeon with Patricia Patti, in which she took viewers inside her grandfather's mansion, providing unprecedented access to the property. She collaborated with Cordelia Francis Biddle on writing the novel Murder, based upon the death of Thomas H. Innes on her grandfather Jan, and continued to live her life normally. The case of Patricia Hearst will remain as a traumatic mystery, with the evidence supporting each side in mind, it's only possible to speculate on why she did what she did after her kidnapping.